So, come to the second talk of the session given by Oleg Sarik from the University of Utah on epidemics theory of interacting spin and liquid. Hey. Sorry, yeah. sorry, five minutes. Okay, good. <laughs> So you hear me? All right, so I would like to thank organizers for <clears throat> inviting me to speak in this nice uh, place we, uh, where I learned so much, uh, so many interesting talks. Um, so I uh, will be talking about a very simple, uh, but I believe still interesting uh, story of which connects to the big question of uh, spin liquids and their response in magnetic field. But before I do that, I would like to take a moment to advertise KTP program for the next summer, uh, a new spin on quantum magnets, which is organized by Christian Batista, Natasha Perkins, uh, Lucille Favre and myself. And the deadline for applications is October 2nd and time moves fast. Uh, um, okay, so uh, <coughs> uh, so this uh, talk is uh, based on a series of papers which I've done in collaboration uh, with Leon Balins at KTP and Anna Kesselman at <coughs> Technion and uh, my former student Ren Bovank, who just moved to a postdoctoral position in the University of Montreal and a group of uh, ESR experimentalists, uh, uh, Kirill Povarov and uh, uh, Andrei Zolodyev from ETH Zurich and uh, uh, Timothy Saldatov and Alexander Smirnov from Kapitza Institute. And so at the end of this talk, I'll show a comparison of uh, our theory with experimental data obtained by these uh, people. Okay, so the outline is uh, such that I will give brief and very uh, general introduction uh, to kind of for the benefit of students of uh, what spin liquid is and uh, fractionalized excitations on a very simple level, and uh, then move on to make a claim that uh, uh, <coughs> putting a spin liquid uh, in a magnetic field actually allows in a way enhances interactions or maybe reveals effects of interactions in a very simple but profound way. And then I'll focus on a one dimensional, very simple, uh, well understood spin liquid where uh, I believe we discovered something that has been overlooked for many years and compare with, experiment, with, with experiments. Uh, okay, so, so the big motivation for this talk and this line of research is really search for spin liquids, which as you all uh, know, I'm sure has been going on for uh, <coughs> in condensed matter for the last 30 uh, and actually probably longer, uh, uh, more years. And uh, <coughs> so the spin liquid is a state of magnetic matter, which breaks no symmetries uh, and is characterized. It's a very quantum state. It's a ground state of a many body quantum system. Uh, and uh, it's an entangled state. And as a result, its excitations are uh, known to be fractionalized, that they carry a fraction of the usual quantum number of uh, magnetic excitations. And I'll say a bit more about that later. And the interactions between them are mediated uh, by uh, gauge fields, which are emergent in the uh, theoretical description of these things. And uh, this is a very exciting uh, and highly motivating proposal. Uh, and the, over years, there were a number of experimental candidates, uh, uh, most of which have uh, failed the stringent test of uh, comparison with theory and turned out to be uh, magnetically ordered uh, materials. But uh, uh, we are still hopeful that uh, this is not a theorem that forbids quantum spin liquids uh, in nature and uh, we will find one. And then the question actually, big question is, how do we know that we see a spin liquid when we find one? So what kind of experiments we do that you know, uh, convinces 
us and also our referees uh, that it is a spin liquid, okay? And this is a non-trivial question uh, because, uh, uh, well, experiments are complicated uh, and there is no universal answer. Uh, and I will certainly not, uh, I, I don't know of one, but again, uh, focus in this talk will be on uh, adding magnetic fields or studying response in magnetic field. Uh, and this is not the unique, but one very useful way of uh, <clears throat> addressing uh, this question. Okay, but so uh, that's a very uh, kind of uh, big picture. So let me, for the again, benefit of student, very quickly remind you uh, kind of key different key differences between uh, so magnetic solids and magnetic liquids. Uh, and so, so we are talking about uh, very simple Hamiltonians. Uh, well, simple to write, difficult to solve. Uh, which are essentially of exchange kind, uh, and I take them to be symmetric. Uh, this is restrictive, but uh, is, uh, and we know that everything, uh, most materials in nature are not uh, uh, isotropic magnets. There are always corrections and they are important, uh, but for the sake of uh, argument, let's start with the simplest Heisenberg model. And then in the ordered state, the wave function is essentially a product state. So for example, for this triangular antiferromagnet, which is sketched here, uh, which we've already discussed uh, uh, many, uh, several times in uh, this uh, conference, the ground state is 120 degree structure of uh, spins. And uh, you can, you know, the wave function you can write as a product. So introduce three sublattices to in this triangle lattice and then specify direction of spin on each of the sublattices, and that's your wave function. And then excitations uh, are uh, spin flips, uh, block waves, uh, which you made of a, a spin flip propagating an appropriate background. So I showed 120 degree structure. This is not it, it's much simpler structure, which is easy to draw, uh, but the magnetic excitation is a flipped spin and it carries spin one, okay? And uh, it, uh, so uh, in neutron scattering experiment, uh, one sends a neutron, which uh, interacts with uh, flips a spin uh, and uh, emits or uh, uh, absorbs a, a spin wave uh, as a result. And for a given uh, momentum, there is a well-defined frequency. So it's a, it's a well-defined quasi-particle. We can study and people have studied questions of our line widths and such, but at the uh, zeros approximation level, it's a delta function like a quasi particle, which is seen experimentally uh, uh, in neutron scattering, for example, as uh, for a given fixed momentum, there is a response at a fixed frequency. Okay, and so that's that's simple. Okay, uh, um, <clears throat> and uh, that's how it has been uh, for uh, some time, even though the history of this subject is highly non-trivial and uh, uh, not straightforward, but um, uh, in uh, uh, late 70s and then uh, again uh, at the end of 90, uh, 80s, sorry, uh, Anderson made a profound uh, suggestion that uh, another type of ground state uh, is possible, fully quantum entangled. Uh, so what, something which we call now spin liquid, uh, it was called resonance invariant bond, uh, where instead of uh, defining magnetic moment on sublattices, you uh, imagine, for example, uh, uh, putting uh, pairs of spins in, uh, in singlets and covering singlets uh, lattice with the singlets. And the idea you know, comes from essentially chemistry, benzene molecule has been analyzed by Pauli, uh, Pauling, uh, sorry. Uh, uh, you know, before, and uh, that's a proper ground state of the finite uh, quantum system, which is a benzene molecule is. Uh, and, uh, but so Anderson have taken it to thermodynamic limit, uh, and of course, uh, uh, gave much more uh, thought to that. And so what's, if we imagine for simply, so such a uh, wave function, uh, so the, uh, the, such a quantum, right, state, which is characterized by all possible pairings, the singlet uh, coverings, okay? So this is a highly uh, non-trivial and entangled state and a very key feature, physical uh, 
uh, feature of this entanglement is that when we try to create an excitation and we create excitation by breaking say one bond, taking it from singlet to a triplet state as shown here, okay? And then uh, by acting with a uh, Hamiltonian on such a state, we can uh, separate this uh, individual uh, <coughs> spin halves forming, making a former uh, singlet as uh, it has become triplet into a pair. Uh, so this pair can be separated infinitely far away. Okay. And so as a result, uh, we have an excitation called a spinon which carries spin half. Okay. And that's a fractionalized excitation. Okay. And the, uh, 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 the <coughs> line of flipped uh, or uh, displaced uh, singlets shown in green essentially is a, a cartoon picture of the gauge field which mediate interaction between this. And so the uh, key physical property of uh, the spin liquid state is that uh, its elementary excitations carry spin one half and uh, they always created in pairs. So any local operator uh, acting uh, so spin flip or you know, group of spin flips in a finite small moment uh, volume, sorry, uh, sub volume of the system creates even number of them. And uh, this uh, uh, is, has profound consequences uh, both for theory and uh, experiment. So uh, this slide I just, so uh, these are all very cartoonish, uh, very simple pictures. I just want to say that uh, you know, in last, uh, let's say 20 years, a huge progress has been uh, made in understanding uh, the spin liquids and we have several kinds, uh, theoretically, we have uh, several kinds of liquids and uh, of which, uh, many of which have been confirmed by, uh, you know, high uh, large scale numerical uh, uh, calculations on model Hamiltonians. So we do know that we can hook up a Hamiltonian, which will have such a ground state. <coughs> and the question is now if, uh, you know, if we can find uh, materials uh, in nature exhibiting uh, these uh, properties and, and study it. But out of all, so there are uh, many kinds of spin liquids and my focus uh, in this talk will be, you know, is highly motivated by one probably the most exotic uh, or at least the most counterintuitive of this uh, is a so-called spin liquid with spin on Fermi surface. So this really is a, a simplest way to think about is a Fermi liquid of neutral fermions. So the uh, spinons are fermions they don't have charge, but they have spin one half. And uh, uh, the spin response of such uh, a spin liquid is determined by the response of spinons interacting with uh, gauge fields. Uh, and so, <clears throat> so now uh, I will start to kind of uh, moving towards a more specific uh, description of what I mean. Uh, so uh, describe the background. And so again, this uh, is uh, the uh, spin liquid uh, state, uh, which I would like properties of which I would like to understand uh, and if possible compare with experiments. And, uh, <clears throat> and so the fact that uh, elementary excitations carry fractional spin, spin one half means that a very basic fact and very important one is that a neutron scattering experiment uh, similar to one I previously shown uh, when neutron creates a spin one excitation, that excitation breaks uh, necessarily into a pair of spinons. Maybe not one pair, it can, be, it can break in two pairs or three, but the leading process, unless something Hamiltonian is very special, is uh, breaking into two, uh, in, in a two spinons. And as a result, uh, momentum and energy of the <clears throat> uh, neutron that transferred to the material uh, is shared between these two spinons. And uh, <clears throat> as a result, oops, for a given uh, momentum transfer, if you look on this, uh, so the pictures are kind of uh, small on this screen. So if you look 
Uh, so what is shown here is experimental data, uh, neutron scattering data from one of the one dimensional materials. And so horizontal axis is momentum transfer, so the K, and the vertical axis is omega, the frequency. And so since you are the total K is made of the sum of two momentum of two spinons and the energies, so that energy and momentum is uh, uh, conservations occur, it means for a fixed total K, uh, there is a range of energies at which you observe response. So what you see is a continuum of spin and excitations. And that continuum is characterized by shape and by intensities. And uh, for example, uh, here for some given uh, momentum transfer, you see a line shape, experimental line shape uh, uh, from that material, which is highly asymmetric, non-trivial, extends to energies, very large energies. So, uh, so this energy range in terms of uh, uh, exchange integral of the underlying uh, magnetic uh, uh, Hamiltonian is several times J roughly, okay? So it's huge. So it's not a width of the order of some you know, fraction of J, but uh, it's several times. Uh, and then here is another example of experimental data from two dimensionals, spin half uh, antiferromagnet, uh, more recent data. And uh, uh, it's kind of great to have this data, but it's always a puzzle. You look at this and try to make a case whether what you see is uh, uh, something which approaches spin liquid or it's some uh, ordered magnet, but which is disordered either by disorder or by some interesting interactions between magnets. And so that's essentially a question which always is present in this field of research, at which point how, what kind of data uh, do we need uh, in order to, again, make a convincing case for the spin liquid, okay? And so let's, uh, so I, again, argue that magnetic field helps to understand and sharpen at least some of those questions. So let's uh, quickly look on what magnetic field does. And I uh, will use the analogy with um, uh, neutral uh, Fermi liquid or other even Fermi gas to first uh, under, uh, kind of explain basic features of VAC. So we apply magnetic field and we split our spin and bands for spin up and down spinons, okay? So uh, by Zeeman energy, of course. And so, and now we ask, so we experimentally will, you know, interested in studying transverse spin dynamics in a, a system which is placed in external magnetic field. So we transverse as plus as minus. Uh, so we create uh, uh, excitations with spin one, total uh, spin one. Uh, and we can do it a number of, in this simple picture in, of course, uh, many infinite number of ways. But well, the simplest one, for example, is a vertical transition shown by this red line going, you know, flipping spin up to down and vice versa. And uh, this uh, momentum does not change. Energy change exactly by the Eman energy as it should. So this point uh, on uh, energy momentum uh, plane. Or we can take a transition, zero energy transition, but between different Fermi points of uh, up and down uh, spinons. And this doesn't uh, cost us any energy, but requires finite momentum, which is this point, another point on the uh, Q axis. And so these two points kind of define this uh, uh, triangular shape uh, uh, wedge within which uh, you have a particle hole response of a spin on gas in this case, okay? And importantly, magnetic field frees up this little corner this little triangle, the white one, uh, where in the gas there are no uh, particle hole excitations. So now, of course, we want uh, to understand system with interactions. So we had the simplest possible interaction, uh, something like uh, local uh, interaction, which respects uh, symmetries. Uh, and uh, in magnetic field, there is a very simple uh, effect when uh, simply essentially mean field uh, really affect where uh, you uh, ask. So this interaction creates a molecular or internal field. So uh, spin with uh, spin up feel 
magnetization, essentially, or polarization created by spin and we spin down and vice versa. Uh, and uh, just, just one second, this is, uh, and, uh, and so in magnetic field, these uh, polarizations for up and down are different. And as a result, out of this, in the, uh, you get a uh, uh, term like that, where U is interaction, M is a magnetization. Uh, and so as a result, the total field that spinons with up and down spins uh, experience are now sum of internal plus this uh, external, sorry, and this internal field. And as a result, your continuum shifts to from Z man energy in this simple naive picture to the energy at Q equals zero to uh, Z man plus U times M. There was a question. Uh, it, 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 it shouldn't be linear, so it's linear for small q, but uh, no, it's uh, for the ease of drawing. Yes. So, so, so for, for the gas, it is for with interactions, it's not. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, uh, Absolutely, absolutely. So with interactions, this thing is filled with, uh, but the spectral weight is much smaller, weaker than inside the continuum. Yes, yeah. But, uh, okay. But so, but so the point of this uh, 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 very simple uh, 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 picture is that uh, this, uh, kind of correctly looking uh, procedure, which looks you know correctly uh, correct, maybe at you know zero, so even minus first order, is actually profoundly incorrect because because we have to recall uh, something which is uh, we know you know from uh, undergraduate studies, Larmor theorem, which is saying that at Q equals zero, zero <coughs> response of magnetic system uh, provided Hamiltonian is symmetric, uh, is uh, right, commutes with a total uh, spin is determined only by external uh, field, which is small h here, okay? So it just, you just com commute total spin uh, and uh, if Hamiltonian is SU2 symmetric, aside from the Zeeman magnetic field piece, uh, that's the only piece that contributes. And as a result, so what Larmor theorem saying is that Q equals zero, all response must be at the, value of non-renormalized Zeeman energy. And uh, so which, but I just explained to you that continuum shifted up by, by U times M. Uh, and what, what it means that there are additional interactions. And in this particular case, it's very easy to calculate the ladder series. They recover this property. Uh, and uh, one finds by summing this infinite ladder series, uh, which describe interaction between spin up and down uh, densities uh, by, as shown by these wavy lines, uh, one obtains interacting susceptibility, uh, which contains a pole. In addition to the particle hole continuum of spinons, there is now a collective mode shown by red, uh, which goes under the name of ceiling spin wave because it was actually originally discovered by ceiling in aid of, uh, at the end of fifties. Uh, uh, and this mode in metals, for, for metals. Uh, and this mode was uh, observed experimentally uh, in 1967. And I just want to make a, a comment uh, that uh, at the time of um, the observation, this was taken as a uh, experimental uh, proof of the Landau thermoliquid. Uh, theory, validity of Landau Fermi liquid theory for the metals, uh, uh, because, uh, because this effect, this collective mode only appears due to interaction. It's uh, effect of interaction. You shift up continuum, but interactions bind, uh, in that case, in Celine's case, fermions to make a collective mode sp with spin one. That mode disperses downwards uh, and it has very nice uh, you know, for, for experimental purposes, uh, property 
that at Q equals zero, all spectral intensity sits in that red uh, uh, branch. And as you move away at finite Q, spectral intensity, some of it shifts to particle hole continuum. So it's a sharp, well-defined peak. So uh, to Nikolai's question, so there is a, a finite lifetime to this mode uh, due to higher order processes. Uh, but it's small. And moreover, again, the same Larmor CRM saying that in the limit of Q going to zero, lifetime becomes infinite because you have to respect uh, the thing. Yes. No, it's it's valid everywhere. Yes, sure. Yes. Uh, what is what? So the so if there are if there is a spin response, so the, so it's a precession of magnetic moment. So if your insulator has magnetic moment, it precesses. You you see it one way or another. Uh, I said the Hamiltonian is symmetric. Yes, yes, yes. So spin orbit interaction will be important for later part of my story, but yes, yes. Um, okay, so, so that's very simple. And so now, okay, so first of all, so that's, that's a, still a warm up. So uh, arguing why, uh, so that in magnetic field, uh, so if we now imagine spin liquid, spin on thermos, uh, spin liquid of the spin on thermosurface surface kind, uh, this physics directly applies there. Okay, so there should be uh, when sub when such a spin liquid is subject subjected to external magnetic field, it the uh, small q and the energy continuum restructure it dramatically. And instead of incoherent particle hole like response, one should see a sharp spin one collective mode with a you know dispersion which we can figure out. Uh, uh, we so thinking of such a spin liquid, one can add effect of gauge fluctuations. So which also contribute to lifetime. We did that, but I will not focus on it here. I happy to discuss it, but you know, it doesn't change the, 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 the basic physics uh, of uh, what I'm describing. Okay. So, so okay, <laughs> as I just said, it would be great to see this uh, physics play out. Uh, uh, in experiment, and here we okay have to face a <clears throat> uh, uh, issue that uh, while we continue hunting for spin liquids, you know the most reliable most re most reliable spin liquids that we have and uh, you know understood and uh, have uh, you know, in some cases a very good experimental control of are one dimensional. So which is not to say so there are some uh, very promising uh, materials, and I just mentioned them because I, you know, uh, like uh, Kagome, uh, antiferromagnet Heber Smithite is still a mystery as far as I, I, I know. Uh, so there are, of course, now Kitaev materials, which are extremely interesting, but to which are the opposite limit of extremely spin orbit coupled uh, materials where this story doesn't apply directly. Uh, and there are some actually spin half uh, uh, triangular antiferromagnets, which are look extremely promising, they're two-dimensional and uh, quasi-two-dimensional look extremely promising, and there are some uh, neutron data appealing uh, on them. But let me take, so uh, focus on 1D, uh, which, uh, because that's where uh, the experiment which I aim to uh, present to you uh, has been done. And so again, I'm showing here a couple of examples of neutron scattering. <clears throat> on a, a, a yet different one-dimensional material. So the top panel is experimental data, bottom panel is theoretical. I believe there is single fitting parameter with exchange uh, energy and then, you know, the colors are intensity. So, 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 okay, there is good understanding, non-trivial line shapes for a given momentum. Again, line, line shapes are extremely long, uh, interesting and delicate, and it's a uh, very interesting and, uh, deep theoretical uh, 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 problem uh, to understand exactly singularities, uh, you know, exponents which govern these line shapes and, and their properties. Uh, but at the uh, and a lot of uh, research has been done by many people in the room, uh, uh, including, you know, Leonid Glasman, and Alexei Tsvelik and uh, others 
uh, but um, uh, those singularities at the same time, uh, you know, experimentally most difficult to uh, observe. So uh, nonetheless, uh, I will argue that placing simple uh, Heisenberg chain in magnetic field leads to features which allow us to directly access uh, interaction between spinons and analyze it. So let me uh, 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 kind of summarize key properties of uh, one dimensional spin half uh, Heisenberg model. Uh, so uh, it's written here. Uh, I, so we have exchange interaction between neighboring spin J1 and uh, for, for future use I add J2. Uh, so connecting next nearest uh, spins and in general uh, we'll have magnetic field. And so a lot essentially is known to this uh, about sorry, this model. Uh, and in particular, so if we look on the ground state, uh, sorry, phase diagram, uh, zero temperature as a function of J2 to J1 ratio. So, so when this uh, in a finite range from zero to essentially a quarter J2 you know, to J1 of 0 0.241, uh, we have gapless Lichinger liquid uh, critical ground state. If we increase J2 beyond this point, uh, it becomes dimerized, uh, spin gap opens. Uh, so uh, in the field, so, so proper or convenient, so there are several uh, theoretical descriptions of this uh, 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 simple Hamiltonian. And I will use something which is called uh, based on spin algebra. And so, uh, because it most directly connects to, to high dimensional spin liquids. And in this description, we have two sets of uh, Dirac fermions, psi R and psi L, which describe excitations near right and left Fermi point. Okay, we linearize the spectrum. So this derivative is just a linear momentum. Uh, and uh, so psi stand for these fermions, so which are spinons. And then we have. Uh, additional uh, in theoretical uh, terminology, marginally irrelevant interaction, which couples right and left spin currents, these J's with index R and L, and J's are really just magnetization densities and right formed at the right and left Fermi points, okay? Uh, and the original spin uh, at a particular point uh, is sum of right and left spin currents. Spin current is a technical term. So they're real different from magnetization current in just uh, terminology. Uh, and then uh, it's the chain is antiferromagnetic. So there is a, a staggered Niel vector, which is a combination of left and right uh, spinners. Okay. And so this is the main interaction term and it's marginally relevant, which means that as you take, as long as J2 over J1 less than this critical value of 0.24, uh, as you go to low energies and uh, you know, long distances, uh, the, this coupling constant G vanishes, progressively vanishes. And in particular, if you look in the ground state of the infinite uh, chain uh, limit, it's simply zero, but it flows to zero logarithmically weakly. And that's the marginal in the marginally irrelevant. Uh, and that happens to play a very important role in what I uh, say uh, I, uh, in, in, in a few slides and show it to you. And so uh, uh, this, <coughs> uh, so uh, with RG scale L, uh, for those who uh, uh, like this way of thinking, you know, G of L uh, vanishes as essentially one over small L, which is log of energy. But in the presence of magnetic field, this uh, flow, which is known as castellet staulis flow, uh, is cut off. And so that uh, at finite magnetic field, instead of going along the diagonal and in this uh, little uh, diagram, uh, oh, one, uh, you know, the, the RG flow changes so that interaction between Z components of spin currents, which are vectors, uh, you know, is uh, finite but interaction between transverse components vanishes. But 
will be in, we are interested in looking at response of this uh, one dimensional spin liquid at energies of order Zeeman energy. And so our coupling constant G is finite in that region and that's important. Okay, so, okay. so that's, uh, and one last uh, sorry, uh, thing to add, this initial value of the coupling constant G is function of the ratio J2 to J1. And so for pure Heisenberg chain, uh, it's something finite and positive in the way I defined it. And as we increase J2 to this point, uh, to four uh, uh, value, it at this point it vanishes. At that point, system has no so the leading marginally irrelevant operator is absent, and the system is described by you know pure conformal field theory uh, with no perturbations. For yes, at zero temperature, yes. Zero magnetic field. Zero magnetic field. Yes. Right. Um, and so now we add magnetic field. Um, and uh, kind of, uh, so this is again thinking of uh, non-interacting spinons first. So you have this transition. So on these two plots, so if you look on the right most, it's more contrast, easier to see. So you see the transfer spin susceptibility of non-interacting spin chain. So chain in which I took back, backscattering constant G to zero by hand. Then of course, it's a very simple calculation. Uh, and so you again see this uh, triangular wedge uh, uh, within which uh, there is a, a spectral weight, even though in one dimension with Dirac fermions, essentially all of the spectral weight is a delta function like concentrated on these boundaries. But okay, for generality, we know that there is a more. Okay, so this non-interacting picture has been you know, extensively used because it's extremely good approximation. Uh, uh, and uh, if we zoom in, uh, and this is a picture, the same picture taken from the you know, uh, uh, um, kind of classic paper of Ishikawa and Affleck shows this again, triangular wedge. So at zero momentum, there is single uh, crossing point. And the first surprise comes when kind of uh, you think, uh, uh, or rather even dig through the literature, looking for numerical data. And then we find uh, that numerically transverse dynamic structure factor of the spin half chain in magnetic field has been studied multiple times. Uh, yes. Uh, so I'm, I'm afraid to do this experiment <laughs> in, re in real time. Oh, view options? Okay. I did what? So is it better or do I need to? Okay. I did stop sharing. Okay, sorry, where is it? Here? No, Zoom. Yes. Share screen. Share screen, yes. Okay, share. Yes, okay, and then? Just view, top right. Top, 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 right, 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 all the way. Right. Mm -hmm. view options, actually, I don't know, either one. No, no, no. Sorry, I didn't see you can go in this one. Oh, okay. oh, right. So you can't see it because it's on the other screen. It's, it's, it's on this screen. No, no. You can probably on this one. If you, if you can. Thank you. Uh, so, okay. So, all right. So, so the point is, there is a finite uh, uh, splitting uh, observed numerically. Uh, so, uh, just look on top row. This is transverse structure factor for different magnetizations. And as magnetic field increases, 
the splitting increases. Okay. And so the first question is, you know, what, what is it? And, uh, and uh, of course, the intuition, which I was trying to present previously, thinking of non-interacting uh, neutral fermions uh, can be used here. So, so we, the only interaction is backscattering, which I now have written here explicitly in Z and transverse components plus and minus. And so uh, proceeding in the mean field like thinking, uh, which turns out to be surprisingly uh, you know, good description in, for this particular problem, uh, we can uh, replace uh, longitudinal components of the spin currents with expectation value, which is just half of magnetization because some of them is uh, magnetization. Uh, and then our continuum as shown by dashed lines here, again, shifts along uh, frequency axis to the renormalized value, just as uh, in high dimensional uh, non-interacting gas that I showed you. Uh, and of course, again, the Larmor theorem is saying this cannot be uh, uh, correct. And we have to account for the transverse interactions. And we've done it, uh, this, can, this can be done in a number of different ways. Uh, but uh, the most uh, straightforward one, which uh, is uh, hydrodynamic-like, uh, which is uh, 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 where uh, we use, utilize this uh, uh, katz moody algebra that uh, the spin currents obey. Uh, so it commutes, you know, the commutator is not only, so the generators of rotation, but the commutator is not only the third component, but also this anomalous piece derivative of delta function. So that's uh, kind of essentially field theory input uh, in this case. And then derive dynamics, uh, uh, equation of motion really for magnetization M, which is sum of spin currents and uh, magnetization current L, which is a difference of spin current, okay? And uh, the, these are two exact equations. So as long as uh, Hamiltonian with linearized dispersion, you know, is a good approximation. So that's exact equation. And uh, uh, interaction only comes in this term M cross L. So this little G is a backscattering interaction. Okay. Proceeding in this uh, way, we say that obviously in magnetic field, there is finite expectation value to M. Uh, we replace it. So there is a delta which is dimensional is the most important dimensional parameter of the theory. Uh, so interaction parameter, so G divided by four pi V, okay? Uh, so delta enters in denominator because we account for molecular fields produced by internal fields produced by the spinons. After uh, that simple approximation, these two equations become linear. And what comes out explains 95% of the puzzling numerics. Uh, which is that now we have two branches. So instead of dashed lines, look on these solid lines. So there is a finite splitting, which is determined controlled by interaction, this dimensional is delta uh, at zero momentum. Uh, the downward branch disperses down just as in high dimensional uh, ceiling wave, the upper branch disperses up uh, and the Larmor theorem is satisfied in the following way that uh, residues, the so if we calculate susceptibility, so mod plus and minus come with residues A plus and A minus, and uh, Larmor theorem is satisfied that at Q equals zero, uh, <coughs> uh, that uh, of the green mod uh, uh, A, 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 A plus uh, vanishes, okay? So at Q equals zero, you see response only from the total spin precession, but at any finite Q, you see two modes and the splitting, and we have, you know, so simple equations describe dispersion and the splitting between these uh, bands. And uh, this has been, okay, Z two minutes, okay. This has been confirmed uh, numerically uh, in the MRG. Uh, and so uh, let me really, okay. Uh, so, Again, numerical data by uh, Anna uh, Kesselman. Uh, so we are looking magnetic field and along horizontal axis pl plotting J2 to J1. So for Heisenberg chain, you see the splitting for a given field is maximal. As we increase J2 to the critical, so this conformal point where backscattering vanishes, that splitting vanishes. 
And so we can fit all these lines by the simple series that I presented to you. So let me now, in two minutes, formulate uh, what has been done experimentally. So there is a, so if we have such an ideal Heisenberg chain subject to magnetic field, as I just explained to you, yet, uh, and we do ESR experiment, which is exactly that, you subject system to magnetic field and you pump it with microwave uh, radiation and observe uh, energy absorption. So, and this experiment measures really vertical transitions because wavelengths of the microwave is huge, uh, bigger than sample size essentially. Uh, and so uh, you really prop Q equals zero. If the chain is ideal, you get just exactly, you know, response at Zeeman energy and you learn nothing about the system, no, no matter how strongly interacting spinons are. The, we are saved by an isotropy, by uh, spin orbit interaction, which in that, in case of particular material, uh, which is uh, uh, shown, uh, listed here, uh, is described the spin, leading spin orbit interaction comes in the form of uniform jaloshinsky maria interaction. So this term S cross S with vector D, which is a spatial vector determined by the crystal structure of that material. And the important point, this interaction doesn't uh, break a translational symmetry. And uh, if you, uh, the uh, essence of the, uh, why it's useful is that uh, already on the lattice level, you can, for the special geometry when B is uh, oriented along magne uh, Jelshinsky Maria axis D, you can perform a position dependent rotation, unitary transformation of your spins. So as to remove Jelshinsky Maria interaction from your Hamiltonian, but the price for this is that since unitary transformation is position dependent, you give a momentum boost to your momenta. So all momenta uh, weight vectors are shifted by D over J, exactly, okay? And so therefore measurements done on such material at zero momentum are equivalent to the measurements done on the ideal spin chain at finite momentum D over J. And so in this way, ESR provides access to small Q region of the dynamic structure factor of spin half chain, okay? And experimentally, I just show the results. So uh, they, so ETH and Kapitza group have done exactly this uh, measurement. And what they observe is best uh, if you focus on this middle plot. So we have two branches. So it's a, we just subtract paramagnetic gamma H line. So there are two branches corresponding to omega plus and omega minus that I essentially was showing. Horizontal axis is now magnetic field, right? The, Momentum at which we probe is set by Zeloshinsky Maria, okay? Is magnetic field uh, and uh, points are experimental data and solid lines is a fit to the theory. And the fit involves single parameter delta interaction strengths, which comes out to be 0.12, okay? The splitting is determined by Zeloshinsky Maria vector determined at zero or very in the limit of vanishing magnetic field. And there's another parameter which is extracted directly from experiment. So in this, these chains are characterized by exchange of order 20 Kelvin and G, Zeloshinsky Maria is 100 times smaller, okay? Uh, visible in ESR. Once this is done, so we determine the interaction, which I renamed to you just because not to be confused with G factor as experimentalists ask. And uh, so, and this is dimensionless backscattering interaction at the energy of evaluated at um, uh, frequency, which is magnetic field, uh, set by magnetic field, okay? Uh, in addition, experimentally, uh, the intensity of the upper mode vanishes relative to the intensity of the lower mode. If we take the ratio, we get rid of all unknown factors. And here is this plot ratio of intensities, which is parameter free. And so you see the, uh, this going through exactly uh, what we predicted. And moreover, the last point, and I stop here. So I was telling you earlier that the coupling constant G or delta in uh, my uh, notations here now is uh, running or flows under G. And so 
And uh, for uh, ideal Heisenberg chain, it's known exactly. So well, almost exactly uh, meaning uh, two. <clears throat> so this result uh, so gives uh, implicit equation of delta as a function of temperature and magnetic field. And we know J, we know temperature, we know magnetic field, we plug in and we get uh, these different curves, which are right in the middle, you know, point 12 is right where it should be. And so this uh, experiment and its theoretical uh, analysis represents to our knowledge the first ever spectroscopic determination of the backscattering interaction in Heisenberg chain. And we, uh, okay. And so at this, I, uh, we have many more uh, data, but I should stop here and thank you. Are there questions? Okay. Thank you. Can you explain a little bit more about what is the effect of the Jerochinsky Morilla in, in your picture? Yes. With the magnetic field, what, what happened? How did the Jerochinsky Morilla modify that picture? So essentially, so yes. So Jerochinsky Morilla, okay. so introduces essentially becomes in this formulation uh, allows us to access finite momentum. So momenta by this unitary transformation, which outlined here. So, so really, okay. So we have Heisenberg term, which wants to spins to do this and Zelshinsky Maria, which if that's the axis, it wants them to be in the plane. Okay. So classical solution, for example, of this, so slow spiral with a pitch, which is determined by exactly DOJ, right? So quantum mechanically, so how we see it, that if we do this simple unitary transformation, uh, your Hamiltonian transforms into this written in terms of spins with tilde, uh, which is almost not quite, and it's important, but uh, uh, Heisenberg term and Zelshinsky Maria disappeared. But all the transformed spins come with a factor e to i x times d over j. So, which means all momenta shifted by this amount. Okay. Oh, so so you can think okay. So you can think by analogy, for example, with uh, Rajba or some other spin orbit. It's internal field built in, which right and left movers, which is opposite for right and left movers. Sorry. Yes, it's a chiral field which uh, which couples with opposite signs to right and left movers, and this provides a momentum boost. That's another way uh, to think of that momentum boost, and which then turns ESR probe into which is q equals zero probe into probe of right and left moving uh spin uh spinons sorry in this chain mm -hmm. question in the chat uh, could you again uh, explain the origin of the spin wave oh so 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 the ceiling spin wave yes uh so uh so in magnetic field, particle whole continuum shifts well as so for small momenta transfer, it shifts up in energy in, and uh, 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 so the particle whole continuum response, sorry, uh, exists uh, within this shaded area, mostly uh, as uh, uh, was correctly pointed out. And then the if that would be the whole story, then Larmor theorem would be violated because look just looking on this shaded uh, cyan uh, you know, picture, you'll, you'll be forced to conclude that at zero momentum system responds at the frequency, which is Z man plus interactions, sorry, times magnetization. And this cannot be true uh, as was recognized by Seelen and many uh, uh, others after him and uh, instead uh, interaction between spinons or electrons and holes uh, in the case of metal uh, produce a bound state with spin one and this bound state uh, determines the response at small uh, momentum what can you say about the um, 
the, the line shapes of the EPR. In other words, uh, it shouldn't be just simply delta functions, right? They, they shouldn't be, yes. And, and so uh, there must be exponents associated with those. So, so right. So the, so the line width uh, roughly scales with temperature, linear sure, in temperature. Right. And uh, we understand that that comes from that the fact that after unitary transformation, xy part of the exchange is slightly different from z part. So there are d squared corrections, which lead to this lifetime. But uh, uh, OK, so I didn't, yeah. But there should also be, I mean, these things should be some kind of power laws. I mean, I'd... So in this particular case, I believe it's temperature. So the, there is no non-trivial power law. We are there's... talking about small q response, so this really was... So there's a, they don't show, in other words, you, you don't see any of the... Uh... So, the, so this for, I mean, you know, and this is an example of line shape, actual line shapes. So it's so it's it was pretty difficult for my collaborators to extract the positions of the centers. So the, the line shape is you know they often overlap. So for example, if you look here, so it's a very good question. And well, specifically, I mean, you could do instead of doing CW, you could do uh, pulsed EPR. And then the question is, what is the decay? Well, with the T1 and T2, the K terms right. for okay. these. So that has not been done yet. So that, but, that, what is it? What is, but the theory would predict some kind of power law. It wouldn't predict the normal. So I think, uh, so to, to lead in other interactions, I think it will be uh, simple power laws, but let me, uh, not, uh, that's my expectation. I thought there would be a correction to that. Oh. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Okay, I don't see any other questions. So let's thank the speaker again. We'll have a coffee break and then come back for the last talk of the session. Thank you.